definitely a better idea to bevel your pieces before you weld them. But what I'm doing is I'm taking a cutoff wheel and right at the seam, running it along the, the seam there. Well, and the reason you can get away with it on this is because this is eighth inch or a little bit less than eighth inch thick. So you're gonna get some penetration. The reason I'm doing this, I'm gonna remove the welds, I'm gonna grind them. A little trick that you can do, a cutoff wheel isn't quite thick enough to make a bevel, so you can get adequate penetration. But if you, you start with that line and then you gradually move your grinder, that's a little exaggerated, but you move your grinder to an angle like that and it kind of widens it out. I've had good luck with this in the past. It's just as easy to bevel your parts first. Like I said, that's probably the recommended way to do it, but that's not what I did. are hollow so it fills up this little enclosure here and gets the oil temperature and you can also see where the levels at these little rubber gaskets seal the holes in the tank
These fittings that we're using on this hydraulic system are 37 degree flares. This is what the fitting looks like. So in order for these to, to seal and go together, we have to put a perfect 37 degree flare on this tubing and then the nut will come down and tighten the, the ferrule on the 37 degree fitting and that's how we make the seal. When you're doing this, make sure you put the nut and then the ferrule on first because after you get the flare on there you can't get the slide the two parts on and there's our 37 degree flare after i wasted about five feet of this stainless steel tubing i figured out it works pretty good to use tig wire and bend up a little a little jig and then try and match that. You can get these lots of uh, broken carbide end mills off of eBay or I think I got these from Rodman Drill. But I want to use these to make some lathe tooling for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's really cheap. Number two, I add to this pile every time I use the mill. So it'd be, uh, it'd be beneficial if I could use this carbide for something. I always seem to miscalculate on the lathe and I use carbide indexable tooling. And I always seem to end up with five thou or 10 thou cut and uh, indexable tooling, insert tooling isn't really that good at making that light of cuts. So there's a couple things you can do. You can use a, a sharp high speed steel tool, which I've done in the past. There's nothing wrong with that. But I wanna try and make a relatively sharp tool out of carbide and see how that does. I put these little scribe marks inside this groove um, because you're supposed to have a little clearance for the silver solder to flow. And I used a quarter inch ball nose end mill to make this groove, and this is a quarter inch end mill. So really when I go to silver solder on this, if this is sitting really tight in this joint, there's not anywhere for the silver solder to go. I'm not sure if you can see them, but I'm hoping that just gives it, you know, a little separation.
to talk a little bit about this. So this is a really nice tool. Uh, I think it kind of goes without saying, but this is just a, a beautiful tool. It's, it's hard for me to, I mean, you could just hang this thing on your wall. I was looking for um, a torch that was a little bit smaller and a little more user friendly than, you know, this is what I had before. It's just, this is the torch body and then it still had the long tip on it. And that's what I use for silver soldering. Well, this probably weighs, you know, three times as much as this. It's, you know, three times as long as it needs to be. So I found this company and it's called Blue Feather Torch. And it's a, it's a fellow by the name of Dan Murphy. He used to, or still does, builds airplanes. So he did a lot of oxyacetylene welding and he designed, developed, and manufactures this in his own shop in Minnesota. You know, I looked around you're not going to find a better torch than this, especially not one made in the U.S. The machining on it is really impressive. It's just a joy to use. This tip that you see on here, this is the silver solder tip that you saw me using in the video. I used 100% acetylene, about six pounds, and it just works amazing. It's awesome. This kit that you see in front of me, this is kind of like the Cadillac kit. You don't have to get all of this stuff. Just shoot Dan a message, tell him what you're doing, and he will recommend what would be best for you. These are the tips that came with it, and you can get a small, precise flame up to a large. The level of control is just incredible, and every, every piece is just beautifully machined. It's just a really nice tool. This isn't even all the tips that he offers. This is the other torch body, and you can attach these extensions, get a little bit more reach. Now, this isn't a cutting torch. Um, although he is working on, I'm not sure if it's available yet, but he is working on a cutting torch. And I can tell you, as soon as it's out, I'll be buying one. Now, Dan did send this to me. I would be more than happy to pay for this. Um, it's just a, it's just fantastic. So I'm going to put some information in the description so you guys can find Dan. Uh, Blue Feather Torch is the company and send him a message and you'll be seeing a lot more of this. I can promise you that. The only other thing that I did was put a nose radius on the end of this tool and we're going to stick it in here and see how it cuts. Honestly, I've done a lot worse on 1018 steel. I can see these lines, but I really, I can't feel them. So honestly, I'm pretty happy with that.
So the power comes in from the top, into the contactor, out of the contactor, into the fuses for the DC power supply, into the DC power supply, out of the DC power supply, up to the valve and the remote, and then over to the breaker for the VFD itself, as per the specs and the manual. I was gonna film some of the wiring, and I did, but I figured you really just couldn't tell what I was doing, and besides that, I'm not the best guy to be teaching electrical work. In fact, I'm very fortunate to have a friend of mine, Kent. He helped me with all of this. He went over everything. If it wasn't for his help, this would have taken me much, much longer. Kent also has a YouTube channel, actually, that I really enjoy. It's hard not to learn something from that guy. He's a smart guy. I'll put a link in the description to his channel so you guys can check him out. This is where the power comes in from the DC power supply. It's grounded and then also goes over here. I don't know if you can see that, but this is the, the jack for the remote. And all I used was like a, it's like for a dump trailer remote. I got it off of Amazon and it seems to work pretty good. I'll just go ahead and tell you guys too, this, for this type of setup, this is the type of valve you're gonna want. Uh, this is a three position tandem center and it's a spring return. So that's what that little squiggly line is here and here. So basically what that means is when you push the button, when you release it, it kind of, it, the spring pushes it back to the neutral position, which is what you want. There's a million types of these valves, and it took me a day just learning about valves to figure out which one of these was the right one to get. But for this scenario, you know, the double acting cylinder for the press, this is, this is the type of valve that you want. Well, I figure you guys might want to see this. This is the first time turning it on with fluid, and I think it's about a 99% chance that we're gonna have at least one leak. There's just too many fittings. But here we go. You know what? Kind of sounds like a hydraulic power unit. Really gives you that strong sense of impending doom. Send it all the way, I guess. So I think it works. I can't believe there's not a single leak. Man, that was a pain in the ass. Okay, so let's talk about the control panel. This is obviously the emergency stop. This cuts power to the entire unit. This has to be out, this has to be on, and then you push the momentary switch. And then the contactor and the VFD have power, but the VFD 
is only on, it's not operable until you push this button. And then the motor will start and the potentiometer controls the speed of the motor. I know this seems like a lot. This is more buttons than you need to get this to work. I could have done it with one switch, but here's the reason why my hydraulic power unit is a little bit different. In order to save me hundreds of dollars, almost a thousand dollars, I bought a VFD off of eBay. I bought a three-phase input, three-phase output VFD, and I don't have three-phase power. But what I do have is a rotary phase converter. So I'm actually running my VFD off of my rotary phase converter from the wall. You know, I read a lot of things about how you're not supposed to do that, but I couldn't find out why. So I actually called American Rotary and manufacturer of the VFD and asked them and they said it should be fine. My particular VFD has inrush control and a bunch of fuses and safety features and they both said that it should be fine. Now to the reason why I have all these switches, if my rotary phase converter is plugged into the wall, even though the rotary phase converter isn't on, it's still sending 220 single phase through the converter into this. So if I plug this in, and it's plugged into the wall, even though the rotary phase converter is not on. If I pushed all these buttons, it would try to send 230 single phase power to the VFD, which isn't what I want. You know, I don't, I don't know if it will hurt it, but it's a three phase input. So I don't want to accidentally send single phase power to the three phase VFD. This controls the flow coming from the pump. There's, there's actually two ways on this machine. If I turn the RPMs down on the motor, I'll also get less flow. But when you do it electronically like that, I'm also losing horsepower. If I went halfway, let's say, then that would divert half of the flow back to the tank and then the other half would go to the cylinder. So if there's one thing that I learned that's really important about hydraulic power units is flow is speed. So basically the higher the flow, like in the United States, they measure it in like gallons per minute. The higher the flow, the faster the cylinder is gonna actuate. The number one thing I see a lot of people doing on YouTube when they build hydraulic power units, they get this, you know, 25 gallon per minute pump thinking that that's gonna make, give them more pressure. The flow has nothing to do with the pressure. And I'll just go ahead and tell you right now, there's a YouTube channel I found and it's called Jim Pytel. I'll put a link in the description. And I would highly, highly suggest that you watch his videos on hydraulics. To me, it's just incredible that it's available for free. He's obviously a professor or something, and he teaches you everything that you need to know. 